Want to welcome you to our Discovering Community class online as we're presenting this option available for people uh, in the unique season that we all find ourselves in. So I want to welcome you to this. The Discovering Community class is our way of communicating our core values, our beliefs, our structure, our vision, and all of those things. So thank you for joining us today. Before we jump into our Discovering Community class, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. It's real possible that you're brand new to community and, you, and uh, you may not know very much about me. Well, my 27th anniversary as pastor at community is Super Bowl Sunday. So every year uh, when that comes, I, it's, uh, it's a great day because I love football, but it's also a reminder of another year serving at community. So uh, 27th anniversary of Super Bowl this year. So I'm excited about that. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Lori, for 37 years. We got married between our junior and senior year at seminary. We have two sons. Uh, Chris lives is our oldest son, and Chris uh, lives in Charlotte, and he's 34 years old. And he's married to uh, Alex, Alexandria, and we have a uh, grandson named Roman. And we found out just yesterday that we have another grandson on the way. We knew we had a grandson, but we didn't, we knew we had a grandbaby, but we didn't know as a grandson. So that's exciting. That's going to happen in June of 2021. So uh, our youngest son, Steve, is 31 years old, and Steve lives in Phoenix, Arizona with his wife, Danielle, and our four grandchildren that are out there. And Steve is a part of a great church in the, the greater Phoenix area, Christ Church of the Valley, and they've been out there for about seven years now, I believe. So my wife is a retired school teacher. She loves the little ones. Uh, she loves teaching, you know, four-year-olds, uh, kindergarten, uh, uh, pre-K four, and then also first graders. And that's, uh, that's her sweet spot, her wheelhouse. She's just a great, great teacher. And periodically, she'll still sub uh, for that age uh, group. Now, uh, as far as me, my hobbies are pretty much, I love football. Dolphins, Miami Dolphins, and also I love to fish. So uh, I bass fish in the Everglades and that's just really replenishing for me. So just wanted to give you a quick update about me. I was a student pastor, a youth pastor, before I became the senior pastor here at Community 27 years ago. Well, in order to fully engage in this class, I want to encourage you to look below this video. There's a link that you can click on for a PDF, and there's, there's a couple of PDFs that are there. One is the class notes that has the fill in the blanks, and if you want to fill in the blank and follow along and do that, that's a great way to do that. It'll keep you engaged. If you'd rather just download the class notes with the blanks already filled in, don't want to make it hard for you. That's, they're going to be there, and so you could do that. Then you could also uh, not have to worry about taking notes, and you could write some other things as well. So either way, that'll work for you. And then there's some other uh, frequently asked questions, uh, links that you can click on, either on this page or on the Decision Day page related to our Discovering Community class. So welcome to Discovering Community 101. It says, uh, we're glad that you've chosen to find out more about Community Christian Church. Discovering Community gives us the opportunity to share our faith, family, and future with new friends. And it's, we're privileged to have people attend from many different church backgrounds. And that is an understatement. Uh, if you've been around community, maybe you're just attending online. You're not able to understand how incredibly beautifully diverse that we are. We have this beautiful mosaic of ethnic and international and racial diversity at community. We have people from over 85 nations at community. And so that's something that we celebrate and that we're excited about. And it says, therefore, we've designed this class to clarify our beliefs and practices as a church family because we have people literally from all over the world people ask how do you how do we pull everybody together how do we unite everyone what's well, a great question and we do that simply by making sure that our primary question is what does the bible say i mean everybody can have an opinion everybody has a background their experiences their traditions but the question that drives us we are a biblically driven church what does the bible say and so that's why uh, we have even this class to give you our understanding. We know that people are going to have different understandings of the Bible, but at least we're asking the right question. What does the, the Bible say? So the basis for this class is you're a member of God's very own family. You belong in God's household with every uh, other Christian, Ephesians 2.19. And so uh, we want you to know what it's like to be a part of the community family. And it may be that at the end of this class, you decide that, you know what, I want to become a member at community. And we would be honored. We would love to have you as a member at community. We want everyone who believes here to feel like they belong here. 
Uh, we have some internal slogans. I'll just go ahead and let you know what those are. Uh, we're, we're a large church, maybe not during a pandemic, but we're a large church that wants to feel small. We want everyone who believes here to feel like they belong here. We really do want to know people's names. And community is a place to believe to belong and to become. And that's a slogan that you'll see on our t-shirts. You'll see that over and over again. And, and that's, that drives us is what we're trying to accomplish. What makes Community Christian Church a family? Well, there are four things that unite us. Our salvation, which is what God has done for us. Our statement, why we exist as a church. Our strategy, how we fulfill our purpose. Our structure, when and where we fulfill our purpose. And so we're gonna talk about those different categories, and let's start off with our salvation. What does it mean to be a Christian? Most people live their entire lives without ever really knowing why, the purpose of their life. They exist year after year with no idea of why they live or God's purpose for their lives. The most basic question a person can ask is, what is the meaning of my life? Everyone wants to be happy, and people try many different ways of trying to be happy, but when we live out of a sense of significance and purpose, then we really can be happy. Some people look for happiness by acquiring possessions. Some look for happiness by ex experiencing pleasure. Some look for happiness by gaining prestige or power, but real happiness comes from understanding my purpose in life. Why did God make me? And when I understand that and I live out of a sense of purpose, then real significance and happiness can happen in my life. So Roman numeral number one there, why am I here? Number one, God made me to love me. I mean, now that might sound like uh, that's old news. I mean, that God loves us. But it's actually new news to a lot of people, not the fact that God loves you, but that God actually created us for the purpose of expressing his love toward us. Jeremiah 31 verse three says, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. He created us so that he could express his love toward us. God's for you. He's not against you, he's for you, and God made us to love us. Number two, we were created to enjoy a personal relationship with God and to manage all of the rest of God's creation. John chapter 10, verse 10, at the bottom of this first page of page two in, in our notes is Jesus' purpose statement, his mission statement. Jesus said, I have come in order that you might have life, life in all of its fullness. So Jesus came to give us the best possible life and he wants us to enjoy a relationship with him and have the fullness of life. The word gospel actually means good news. And it is that Jesus came to give us the fullness of life the best possible life. The next page, as you turn that to the top of page three, it says when we know God and love God and live in harmony with his purpose for our lives, it produces tremendous benefits or blessings in our life. And you can see those, clear conscience, purpose, power and strength, life and peace, confidence, fulfillment, help with weakness, security, freedom. And you can look up those verses on your own, but God again is for us and he, he wants to bless us and he wants to use us in, in our lives. It's the kind of lifestyle that God intends for us to live. And this is the interesting part. This is what God wants for us. And this is what we want for ourselves. You, you look at those items that are there. And if that's what God wants for you, and that's what you want for yourself, why then aren't most people really happy? What's the disconnect? What's, what's the problem? What's the deal? Well, I put what's the problem there. This is the problem. Man has a natural desire to be in control and to ignore God's principles for living. We wanna do life on our terms and our way and say, don't tell me how to live my life. I'm gonna do life my way. Look out for number one, do your own thing. Uh, slogans, sometimes people say, if it feels good, do it regardless of what God says about it. It's my life and I will do what I please. And we've, we've heard people say that. We've maybe thought that. We maybe have said that ourselves. And the Bible calls this attitude sin. It's just this rebellious spirit against God. God created us. He's for us. He wants us to live this best possible life. And yet we want to try to do life on our terms. And oftentimes it doesn't go very well for us. The Bible calls this attitude sin. Isaiah 53 verse six says that all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. First John chapter one, verse eight says, if we say that we never sin, we're only fooling ourselves and we refuse to accept the truth. The truth about me 
even though I'm a pastor, is that I'm a sinner. And I, I, don't, I really don't want to insult you this early into the video, but that's the truth about you too. I mean, you are a sinner. We all are. That's just the truth. Now, what happens as a result of that? Sin breaks our close relationship with God. It causes us to fear God and to try to live our lives outside of his will. We try to live our lives on our terms. Sin breaks our close relationship with God. It causes us to fear God and try to live our lives outside of his will. When we sin, we have this, um, this resistance towards God, this distrust toward God. We don't believe that God is really for us. We believe that he's against us. And it's, it's like we, we see something that's over there and it looks like it would be, you know, amazing. It would be compelling. It's like God's created this world and all these pleasurable, amazing things that we can experience. And God says, you see everything? We go, yeah, I do. And God says, okay, good. You can only live within this, in this little box. And he just boxes us in. And it's restrictive and conforming and it's not liberating. And so we say, God, I, I, I want to live outside of this, but I want to, I want to live. I want to walk down that path. I want to go where those people are. It looks like they're having a lot of fun. And God goes, you know what? I, I understand that, you know, and, and millions, billions of people have gone down that road themselves because they thought that it would bring them happiness and joy. But I've got to tell you, it's not going to give you what you think it's going to give you. It's not going to take you where you think it's going to take you. Well, I, what about over there? Then I want to go there. Well, same thing. It's not going to, it's not going to give you what you think it's going to give you. It's, it's just going to, it's just going to wreck you. And the truth of the matter is every kick has a kick back and, and, and God is for us. He's, he's not, and first of all, it's not like he's saying that we can live only in this little, God is for us. And there's so much in this amazing world that he's created for us, but he has given us some boundaries and he certainly has given us some restrictions. Why? Because he wants to protect us and he wants, it's, it's like a father that, that loves their child or a mother that loves their child and, and no, you're, you're three years old and you can't go riding out in the street where there are cars. Why? Because it could be very dangerous. And so you cannot do that. There's a boundary that you can't cross. And, and so God gives us some boundaries because he's a loving, caring, heavenly father, that if we were to cross those boundaries, it's going to bring pain to us and it's going to bring pain to other people. And so whenever you come to a negative command in the Bible, a thou shalt not, you don't do this. You shouldn't look at it as a negative. It's actually God protecting us. We should actually, they're not in your notes, but you should write the word that God wants to protect us from harm and preserve for us the best possible life. And, and you know, when God says, thou shalt not lie, why does he say that? I like to lie. I want to like deceive everyone. I said, okay, let's play that out. If you were to lie, trust is the foundation of every relationship. Is it not? And if people were to know you as a serial liar, it's going to undercut, undermine every relationship that you have, and you'll end up alone at the end of your life. So God says, do not lie. Why? To protect us from the fallout of that, protect us from harm, and to preserve for us the best possible life. And so God's for us. He's not against us. So sin, it breaks our close relationship with God. It causes us to fear God and try to live our lives outside of his will. It says the trouble is that your sins have cut you off from God. It separates us from God. Romans 3.23 is a really interesting verse of scripture. The apostle Paul wrote these words and he wrote, all have sinned, past tense, and fall short, present tense of God's glorious ideal. Now, if we had uh, an English teacher that was watching, they would take out their red pen and then circle this because Paul did something that you absolutely don't do when you write. He changed tenses in the middle of a statement of a sentence. So Paul was either made a mistake or he's making a point. I'm going to go with the second one. He's making a very deep theological point, which is all have sinned past tense. That's the truth about me. I've sinned in my past. It's also the truth about you. But he says, it's not enough to say that we have sinned. We continue to fall short present tense. And the verb that is the present tense verb has continuous action into the future. And so Paul says, this is the truth about you and me. He says, we've sinned in the past. We're going to continue to sin in the present. We'll sin in the future. And so we're, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I, God, I, 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 
I, I kind of wanted to spiritually arrive so I could go to heaven one day. And, and God says to us, well, if you think you're going to be acceptable to me based on your own goodness, then you need to think again. You need to get off this performance track and get on the grace track because that's the only way you're going to have the hope of heaven. You're never going to be good enough because you have sinned, you continue to sin, and you will always sin. We'll always be separated from God because of our sin. The good news is we have a Savior, and Jesus forgives us of our sin. And we're going to get to that just a, a little bit more here. And it says, when people have problems, they often try many different ways of coping before turning to God. I often will say that life bounces more like a football than it does a basketball. Basketball is kind of pretty predictable. Football, sometimes it'll bounce right to you. A lot of times it'll, you know, it'll bounce off and it's not predictable. And that's the way life is. It's just not predictable. And, and sometimes uh, life doesn't go according to the script. Oftentimes it, it does uh, not go according to the script or the way that we had played out things. And uh, so it doesn't go the way that we had liked. And so life, uh, is challenging. There's no question about that. There's a philosopher from the Middle Ages by the name of Blaise Pascal that said that every single one of us has a God-shaped hole in our heart that can only be filled by God himself. So we have this, this vacuum, this hole in our heart that can only be filled by God. And we know that something's missing, but we're just not sure what it is. And so a lot of times people try to, to fill that void, that hole in their heart with possessions or with, uh, with accomplishments or, or with, um, you know, with power, whatever it is. I mean, we just try to say, we try to run fast enough so that we don't sense the missing piece that's in our life. And, and so there's a way that seems right to a, a man, but they only end in death. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. And, and so as we get to the top of page four, it says, even when we know that our deepest need is God, we have this God-shaped hole in our heart. And it's like God's homing signal that draws us back to him. When we know that, we often try wrong ways of getting to know God. We do. And, and uh, the first one is salvation by heritage. As my mother was a Christian, so therefore I'm a Christian. Or my uncle was a pastor, therefore I'm a, a Christian. And, and we believe that somebody else's faith saves us. And that's just, you know, it's just not true. I heard somebody say uh, one time that God has no grandchildren, only children. And I like that. I mean, if you are the beneficiary of someone else's faith and they pass their faith on and you have a faith heritage in your family, be thankful for that. But it doesn't save you. God has no grandchildren. He only has children. We all have to come to God on our own terms, in our own way, in our own relationship. So salvation by heritage is the wrong way of thinking that we can get right with God. It doesn't matter what you believe, just be sincere. Uh, you know, we, we think in, especially in our country, that sincerity is the most important thing, even more important than truth. And, you know, is that really true, though, that it doesn't matter what you believe, just be sincere? Um, I tell sometimes stories in, in this class. Uh, well, let's say there's a little kid by the name of Billy, and Billy let's say um, let's say he's five years old and there's a teacher that's teaching and the, t the teacher asks the class and, and says okay kids does anybody know what two plus two is and little Billy raises his hand and said I know what it is two plus two is ten and all the little kids they, they kind of like smirk and laugh at him but the teacher does it and she says Billy are you sure that two plus two is ten and he goes yeah I know it is she said Billy are you sure that two plus two is ten I'm confident that two plus two is ten she said well Billy if you believe it that strongly then two plus two is 10. Now, would a teacher say that to a, a little five-year-old guy? Hope not, because the fact that Billy believes something doesn't make it true. I mean, truth is truth, and you can believe something real strongly and still be mistaken. So sincerity is important. I mean, we need to be sincere about our faith, but it's also we need to believe that which is right, believe that which is true. And um, it was back in, in March of 1997, that uh, 39 people, they, they committed suicide. It was the largest mass suicide on U.S. soil. It, it took place in San Diego, California. It's when they believed that the Hale-Bopp comet was going through our solar system. And if they, they took their lives at the exact right time, that they'd go on this kind of interstellar journey. And um, most people would not question their sincerity. I mean, that's the greatest evidence of your sincerity. You're willing to, to give your life or to take your life for something that you believe in. But most people would say, yes, they were sincere. 
Uh, but they were sincerely wrong. Sincerity is important, but so is truth. And so salvation by sincerity alone doesn't save us. We have to believe that which is true. I'll be religious and I'll go to church, salvation by religion. Uh, it might sound something strange for a pastor to say that, um, that church attendance can be hazardous to your spiritual health, <laughs> uh, especially in a pandemic. Uh, we do want you to come back, by the way. But it, it can be hazardous to your spiritual health if you believe that church attendance saves you because it doesn't I, I i'm all for church attendance why that's where we learn it's where we grow it's how we fuel our faith and feed feed our, our spirit and how we uh we can celebrate and honor god and, and praise him but um it doesn't save us and so church attendance doesn't save us salvation by religion there's an old country preacher one time said that sitting in a church doesn't make you a christian any more than sitting in a chicken coop makes you a chicken. So it's not great theology or even great humor, I'll be honest. But it's an okay point. Sitting in a church doesn't make you a Christian. So it can help you to find out how to become a follower of Jesus, but it doesn't save us. The last two are kind of, you know, two sides of the, of the same coin. I'll give up all my bad habits, which is salvation by subtraction, or I'll work really hard and I'll try to earn it, which is salvation by works. And salvation by works or good works is the way that most people believe we go to heaven. Why? Because it makes sense. I mean, there's a strong correlation between what we do and, and our salvation. If I do enough good things, then, then that means I should be able to get into heaven, right? I mean, most of us even think of this as like an eternal kind of a scale that, that God puts all the good things on one side of the scale and all the, the bad things that we do and have done on the other side of a scale. And if the good things outweigh the bad things, well, that's pretty good for us. But if the bad things outweigh the good things, well, that's not so good for us. And it's like there's this eternal scale or this, this good-o-meter that uh, determines whether we go to heaven or not, which is the first video that you're gonna be able to see in this class. Just, uh, you're gonna like this one. Here is the good-o-meter. Next. File, please. Mm -hmm. Some lying, some stealing, and some acts of kindness here and there. I tried to live a good life. Well, let's see how good. This way. Next. Bio, please. Okay, I admit it. I did a lot of bad things. Yes, I see. But I've done good things too, you know, to offset the bad things. Like one time I cheated on a test, but then I cleaned up trash in the park. Mm-hmm. That should balance out, right? Let's find out. This way. That should have balanced out, right? It should have balanced out. Next. Bio, please. Impressive. Oh yeah, I devoted my entire life to make this world a better place. I dug wells in Africa, I donated blood every month, and I ran an orphanage in India. I mean, I just wish I could have done more. Mm-hmm. And is this your subscription? I only read the articles. I only read the articles! Next. My mom goes to church. I was baptized as a baby? Take American Express, right? Next. File, please. Whoa. Somebody's been busy. Well, let's get this over with. Sorry, um, I didn't know he was with you. Okay, step on the scale. Not you. Him. Hey, wait a minute. That is totally not fair. Yeah. That's why it's called grace. Next. 
next. I love that video, and that is why they call it grace. And we can be thankful for God's amazing grace because, again, most people think that, that we're going to be saved based upon what we do or by what we don't do. And if we do more good than bad, then that's going to be good for us. But if we do more bad than good, well, it's not going to end so well for us. But we're not saved. We are not saved. You're going to hear me say this a few times. We are not saved based upon what we do but based upon what Jesus did on a cross. And whether we accept that very free gift or not, what's the solution? Is we ask different ways to come to God. Jesus said, I am. He said, I am the solution. I am the way, he said, John 14, verse six. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is the solution. He is the way. In that box there, it says God himself came to earth as a human being to bring us back to him. If any other way would have worked, Jesus Christ would not have had to have come. The way is a person. Now, there's a statement there about Jesus has already taken care of your sin problem. Now, there's all so much packed into that. Jesus came from heaven he, he grew up, he, he was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life. He intentionally went to the cross to pay for the penalty of your sins and my sins. And he took care of our sin problem. So he died as a substitute for us so that we wouldn't have to pay for the penalty of our sin. It says he's taken care of our sin problem. And if you've ever sinned and we, we acknowledge that you have and that I have, then you have a problem. And whether compared to other people, you kind of have a small pile of sin or you got a medium sized pile or you got a big old huge pile. You know, in one sense, it, that's irrelevant. In another, it's not because, I mean, sometimes sin has consequences. Even though sin can be forgiven, there can be consequences that ripple out. But regardless of how many sins we have in our lives, we have a sin problem because if our sins are not forgiven by God, then we can never have the hope of heaven. And so that's why Jesus dying on the cross is so significant and important for us. It says in Romans chapter six, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And wages are something that we, we deserve, we earn, and, and that's death. But the gift, which is something that we don't deserve, the gift of God is life, eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, God did this for us because he loves us and he wants us to know him. He wants us to have the hope of heaven. He created us so that he could express his love toward us. Romans chapter five, verse eight says that God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still separated from God by our sin, Christ died for us. So Jesus died for us to forgive us of our sins. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 is uh, an interesting verse of scripture. It creates this, this, this image. It says, God is on one side and all the people are on the other side. And Christ Jesus is between them to bring them together by giving his life for all mankind. So Jesus is this bridge builder. He's between us and God because he's both, because God is here and, and Jesus is in the middle. He's both God and man. He's in the middle and he, he builds this bridge between God and man and he died as a sacrifice for our sin. And it says in this box here, God's already done his part to restore our relationship with him. He took the initiative. Now he waits for each of us to individually accept what he has done for us. Our salvation is not based on what we do, but on what Jesus did for us. So again, I'll say it. Uh, your hope for heaven, it's not based upon your own goodness. It's based upon the goodness of Jesus. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can never be good enough. It's not based upon what you do or, or, or what you don't do, but based upon what Jesus did for you and whether you accept that free gift, that sacrifice or not. So what does God want me to do? Now we're on the top of page five here. And it says, number one, it says, admit that God has not been first place in your life. And I mean, if we're honest, you know, we can all pretty easily say that that's been the, the truth about us at different points in our life. And maybe that's the truth about you right now. It says, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, if we confess, and when you confess, you, you admit, I, I did it, I confess, I did the crime. I admit, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from every wrong. Number two, believe that Jesus died to pay for your sins, that he rose again on Easter and he is alive today. And so you have to believe that Jesus paid for the penalty of, our, of your sin and that he is the resurrected Lord. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse nine, if you confess that Jesus is your Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
And number three is the real, the important one. Accept God's free gift of salvation. Don't try to earn it. And we do, we try to earn it. We think that we need to play a part in the salvation process. The only part that we need to play is to accept the free gift of salvation. Well, let me, let me put it this way. I'll, t- I'll tell you a story. Um, it's not in the Bible, okay? It is absolutely not in the Bible. It's a little humorous, not a lot, so don't get your hopes up. Setting the bar pretty low there. Uh, and it starts off with a guy that dies and he goes to heaven. And um, St. Peter is at the pearly gates. And there's a reason for that in the Bible. But, and that's why you hear stories like this sometimes. But the apostle Peter, St. Peter's there at the pearly gates. And he says to this guy, hey, in order to get into heaven, you gotta get a thousand points. Not in the Bible. And so he says, Tell me what you've done, I'll score it out. And if you get a thousand, it's gonna be a good day for you. If you don't get a thousand points, well, it's not gonna be a good day. So the guy says, well, in my church, we had a lot of middle school kids and they'd go through teacher after teacher after teacher. And one year I decided I'd teach the middle school boys class and I taught the middle school boys for 25 years. And, and um, it was hard, I'm not gonna lie, but, uh, but I did that. And Peter goes, you taught middle school boys for 25 years? Wow, and he, hey, Gabriel, he's talking to the angel Gabriel, taught middle school boys for 25 years. And, Gabriel's kind of wow. And so Peter goes, well, that's awesome. That, that's one point. And the guy goes, one point, one point for that? You gotta be kidding me. So he said, well, also in my church, Sunday school attendance was really important. And so not only would I teach this class, but whenever we would go out of town on vacation as a family, not only would we go to church, but I would find a church that would have a Sunday school for adults and I would go. And I had perfect attendance in Sunday school for for 30 years. And Peter goes, wow, that's incredible. That's a a second point. Guys, second point, that's all I get. Um... Okay, yeah, in my church, we, we had a lot of land, but we didn't have a lot of money. And so uh, for 35 years, you know, every Saturday from, from May to October, and sometimes a little before and a little after, I'd sit on the riding lawnmower and I'd, I'd mow the church lawn. Sometimes it was so thick and so hard, it would take me three, four, five hours to mow that. But I did it for, for 35 years and never charged a church a dime. It was just my gift to the, to the church and to the Lord. And... Peter goes, that's impressive. That's a third point. And the guy just goes, puts his head, his hand in his head. And says, wow, the only way I'm going to get any, here's by the grace of God. And Peter goes, grace of God. Oh my word. That's 997 more. Come on in. Okay. So I didn't say it was that funny, but it does have a point. And I actually, that's theologically incorrect because if the guy said taught middle school boys for 25 years, Peter said, that's awesome that you did that. But as far as getting into heaven, zero points. Perfect attendance in Sunday school. That's great that you attended. Probably should have stayed home sometimes because you're sick. Some other people made it to heaven a little sooner than they should have, but that's between you and them. You guys can work that out. But um, as far as getting to heaven, zero points. Mowing the church lawn, free gift of service, your act of love for your church, wonderful thing you did. But as far as getting in heaven, zero point points. Grace of God, a thousand points. And so we just need to be reminded again and again that it's not based upon what we do or what we don't do, but based upon what Jesus did. It is his grace and by his grace alone. If I had a board up here, you know, and I was, I was writing on something and, and I do the salvation equation, um, uh, we think this way. We, we think that, you know, if I was to write and it says the cross plus my good works equals salvation and God's going, whoa, 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 whoa. The cross is enough. I want you to do good works not in order to be saved, but because you have been saved as an expression of your gratitude and thankfulness for what I've done for you. But the cross is enough. You don't need to add your good works to the cross in order to be saved. What Jesus did for you is, is, is enough for sure. And, and so Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, it says, for it is by grace that you are saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, not by our works. Why? So that no one can boast. If we were saved by our works, then, then everybody would be kind of strutting around heaven and say, well, I'm here because I, you know, I, I dug wells in Africa or ran an orphanage in India or because I did this or I did that. And there's not gonna be any of that. The only thing that we're gonna boast about is the fact that we're all, sinners that have been saved by God's amazing grace. And we have the hope of heaven because of what Jesus did for us. And so 
It's by grace that you're saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. Now it says grace is God's part. Faith is man's part. And faith is expressed in obedience. That's what God calls us to do, to trust him. And trust is the foundation of every relationship. Our relationship to God is not restored by anything we do. I'm saying it again and again because it certainly goes against what our culture communicates to us. But it's on the basis of what Jesus already did for us. And we just have to accept that. And so number four, as far as uh, what does God want me to do to be right with him is invite Jesus Christ to come into your life and be the Lord of your life. And it says again in Romans chapter 10, verse nine and 10, it says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the, for with, uh, the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So we come to that point where we decide that we're going to make Jesus the Savior and Lord of our life. And then key is on the top of page six, number five, show your obedience to God's plan for salvation by being immersed in the biblical mode of baptism. So I want to talk to you about baptism for a few minutes. And so we respond to God in obedience by being baptized into Jesus Christ through the, the mode, the biblical mode of immersion. And so I'll talk about that in a moment. At the bottom of page six, it says, baptism is part of my faith response to God. So I, I believe, I believe what Jesus has done for me. And then I express that belief in an obedient way through being baptized into Christ Jesus. So why should I be baptized? It's a great question. We're gonna answer that. Number one, to follow the example set by Jesus. Jesus himself gave us the example of being baptized in the water in the Jordan River. Mark chapter one, verse nine, it says, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth. He was baptized by John. That's John the Baptist in the river. It's the Jordan River. So Jesus gave us the example to be baptized. Number two, because Jesus commands it. That's your fill in the blank. Jesus commands it. We're commanded to be baptized. It says in Matthew 28, it says, Jesus said, go then to all people everywhere and make them disciples. Baptize them. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I commanded you. And so he commands us to be baptized. And he, that is known as the Great Commission, Matthew 28. And so we're baptized. Why? He gave us the example and then he commands us to. And then uh, number three, at the top of page seven, it says, it demonstrates that I really am a believer. It says, many of the people who heard him, they, were, they believed and they were baptized, Acts 18, eight. And so as you go through the book of Acts, which is the history of the church, you're gonna see belief in baptism, belief in baptism, belief in baptism, because those are the primary faith responses that we have when we, we follow Jesus. Now, what is the meaning of baptism? I, I love talking about this. Um, Baptism illustrates Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. Baptism is this beautiful picture of the two most significant events in the history of the world. The crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. Sometimes people would say, well, I understand the crucifixion because that's where he died on a cross for our sins. Why, why is the resurrection on the same level of significance as the crucifixion? Here's why because there were thousands of Jewish men that were crucified in the first century AD by the Romans, but only one rose from the dead from a crucifixion. And so when somebody rises from the dead, we need to pay attention to what they say. So the crucifixion and the resurrection are the two most significant events in the history of the world. And it's the resurrection that validates what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross in our place as a substitute so that our sins would be forgiven so that they would be washed away. Now, since those two events are the most significant, this is why baptism is by immersion is such a powerful because baptism by immersion is a dramatic reenactment of the two most significant events in the history of the world. The apostle Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 15 verse three, he says, Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and then he rose again. Paul also wrote Colossians chapter two verse 12 where he gives strong allusions to what is taking place at baptism, but he's gonna be even more clear in Romans chapter six. But in Colossians two, it says, for when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ, and in baptism, you were also raised with Christ, Colossians chapter two verse 12. Then 
he gets really clear in Romans chapter six. I love this passage of scripture because Paul tells us what, what's happening in baptism. Paul says in Romans chapter six, verse three, he says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. What Paul is saying here is that whenever we witness a baptism, by immersion, whenever we see a person buried with Christ in the waters of baptism and raised with Christ, we see this dramatic reenactment of the two most significant events in the history of the world. And it doesn't matter where the baptism happens. I mean, the baptism can happen in a, I'm in the auditorium right now. It can happen in our baptistry in this space. We have a beautiful baptistry that's in our courtyard. It can happen in a pool. It can happen at the ocean. When a person is baptized by immersion, they stand in a vertical position. And at that point, they're reenacting when Jesus was hanging on the cross. When that person who is baptized by immersion is, is lowered back into the water, they are, for a moment, they, they're flat on their back. Their eyes are closed and they're no longer breathing. And this is a reenactment of when Jesus was dead and when he was buried and in the tomb. And when that person comes up out of the water, the first thing they do is they catch their breath and then they open up their eyes and it's a dramatic reenactment of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So every time that we witness a baptism, we're seeing this dramatic reenactment of the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's awesome, that is so powerful, but it's more than that. It's more than a dramatic reenactment. The apostle, Paul says that we actually are sharing with Jesus in his crucifixion. We're sharing with Jesus in his death and his burial. And we're sharing with him in his uh, resurrection in, in some kind of a spiritual or mystical way. Again, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him. We're sharing with him in his death through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So when you see a baptism of a person, yes, it's a dramatic reenactment of the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But it's more than that. It's a sharing with Jesus in his crucifixion in a spiritual, mystical kind of way. I don't understand but God does. And when you see them buried under the water, it's not just reenacting Jesus' burial, but it's sharing with Jesus in his burial in some kind of a spiritual way. And then when that person comes out of the water, it's not just a reenactment of the resurrection, it's a sharing with Jesus in his resurrection. Paul says, if that's not good enough, <laughs> let, me even, let me up this one more time. Let me even take it to the next level. He doesn't say that, but I say that because that's what's happening. It's not just a reenactment. It's not just a sharing, but for the individual, they are actually having their own spiritual crucifixion. They're having their own spiritual burial. Yes, they're reenacting. Jesus burial and they're sharing with Jesus in his burial but they're having their own and they're having their own spiritual resurrection as well Paul says in verse 5 it says if we have been united with him like this in his death we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection we're sharing with him in that then in verse 6 this is where it, it, it just goes to the next level it says for we know that our old self was crucified we're having a spiritual crucifixion with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. That's why baptism is such a powerful experience. You get to not only reenact what Jesus did on the cross, you share with him in some spiritual kind of way, but you have your own spiritual death and everything that you've ever done is, is nailed to the cross of Christ. And as you're lowered in that waters, you're sharing with Jesus in his burial you're having your own spiritual burial and everything that you've ever done, every sin that you've ever committed or will commit is being washed in this watery grave of baptism. And then just as Jesus rose from the dead, you share with him in his resurrection, you're, you're having your own spiritual resurrection. You're coming out of that watery grave and, and you're entering into this newness of life. And that's why fill in the blank number two, it says it illustrates my new life as a Christian. And 2 Corinthians chapter 
uh, five or 17, when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. The old life has passed away and a new life has begun. And everything we've ever done is, is, is washed and cleansed and washed away. And we come up new and fresh in Christ Jesus, this new life. And that's uh, so powerful and so amazing. The top of page eight, the fill in the blank is the word point. Um, baptism is the point where all of God's promises are received when preceded by faith and belief and repentance and confession. That Simon Peter, uh, on the day of Pentecost, when he opened the doors of the kingdom of God, of the church, he said in Acts chapter two, verse 38, he said to them about what they needed to do to respond to God. He said, Peter said to them, each of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that for the purpose that your sins will be forgiven and you will receive God's gift, the Holy Spirit. Now, why be baptized by full immersion? It's a good question. There are three primary modes that people are baptized that I'm aware of. There's baptism by sprinkling or christening, which often is when uh, it's a baby, but I know uh, of students and also adults that were baptized by sprinkling. Uh, then there's baptism by full immersion, which is how we baptize here at community. And I think most of us are probably familiar with sprinkling and full immersion. But then there's a baptism by pouring. It's more water than sprinkling. Water is poured on top of the individual, but it's much less water than full immersion. Why do we baptize by full immersion at community? It's a good question. Well, number one, because Jesus himself was baptized by immersion. In Matthew chapter three, verse 16, it reads, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Now that's just circumstantial there. He went into the body of the water of the Jordan River. Then he, then he came up out of that. But I'll tell you why we know that Jesus was baptized by immersion in just a moment, why there's, how there's greater clarity to that. Number two, every baptism in the New Testament was by immersion. We see again, the circumstantial evidence, so to speak, in Acts chapter eight, verse 38 and 39, it says, then both Philip and the man went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, so they go down into the water, there's immersion, they come up out of the water. But the way that we know that uh, this man's uh, baptism was by immersion and Jesus' baptism certainly was by immersion and every other one was because that's what the word means, baptizo. It says the word baptize means to dip under, to dip under, to immerse, to submerge. And when it comes to water, it means to dip under water. The Greek word baptizo means to immerse or to dip. And when it relates to water, it means to dip under the water. And there are different words in the Greek that relate to sprinkling and pouring and immersion. There, there's a Greek word for, uh, sp for sprinkle that is rantizo. And rantizo is never used in the context of baptism of a person. It is just always baptizo, which means to dip or to plunge or to fully immerse. Well, what about pouring? Is, is that word ever used? It's never, kio is the Greek word. Kio is never used in the New Testament in the context of baptism. It is only baptizo, which means to dip or to plunge or to fully immerse. At the top of page nine, Baptism by full immersion symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. When we talked about a person standing in the water and then going underneath the water, we can certainly, we see the imagery of a burial. And then when that person comes up out of the water, we can certainly see the imagery of a resurrection. That imagery, that symbolism is, is lost. It's just, it's just not evident. It's not there when it relates to baptism by either sprinkling or by pouring. Now listen to these different founders of different religious denominations about what they said about baptism. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer of the Middle Ages, the founder of the Lutheran church said, I would have those who were to be baptized to be entirely immersed as the word imports and the mystery signifies. 
John Calvin of the Presbyterian Church says the word baptize signifies to immerse. It is certain that immersion was the practice of the ancient church or the early church. John Wesley of the Methodist Church says buried with him alludes to baptizing by immersion according to the custom of the first church. And then Brenner, who is a Roman Catholic Church scholar, said for 1,300 years was baptism and immersion of the person underwater. And, and what, is, what is he referring to? Well, Brenner is referring to the fact that it was in 1311 at the Vatican Council at Ravenna when uh, the decision was made that they were going to accept a non-immersion baptism as a valid baptism. So for 1,300 years, the only baptism that was accepted as a valid baptism by the church was baptism by full immersion. It's not to say that there, were, that there weren't um, baptisms by sprinkling or baptisms by pouring that happened during the first 1,300 years. Certainly they did, but they, they, weren't, they weren't accepted as valid. It was in 1311, said, we're going to accept as a valid baptism of the baptismal candidate as long as they are in a running body of water, had to be a stream, couldn't be like a lake or a pool or anything like that. It had to be a stream. Um, and, uh, and then the water has to be poured on top of the individual. It seems like an accommodation based upon limitations of, uh, of water. And, uh, but for 1,300 years, God's plan the, and his church baptized by full immersion. Why? Because that's the imagery of the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of, of Jesus. So um, who should be baptized? Every person who has believed in Jesus. And it says in Acts 2.41, those who believed, they accepted his message, they were baptized. I mean, again, you look in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, there's belief in baptism and belief in baptism. And that's, that's the standard response there. And Simon himself believed and was baptized. Acts 8.31. 13. Acts 8, 12, it says, but when they believed Peter uh, or Philip as he preached the good news in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So there's belief in baptism. And, and so that's what we ask everyone to do, to be a part of the community family, is to be baptized in the biblical way, baptism by full immersion. It says, at community, we wait until our children are old enough to believe and understand the true meaning of baptism before we baptize them. So we have... Uh, baby dedication, or it's really more parent dedication ceremonies when parents dedicate themselves to raise their children to love God and to honor God in their lives, and they're dedicating themselves to do that. And, and, uh, but we don't baptize uh, infants. We don't baptize babies. Why? Because they, they can't believe. They don't have faith in that sense. And so babies weren't baptized in the New Testament. And so we wait until children are old enough and we have classes that are taught for them to be able to understand and grasp this on a level that they can understand. And so now some churches practice a baptism of confirmation for children. This ceremony is intended to be a covenant between the parents and God on behalf of the child. The parents promise to raise their child in the faith until the child's old enough to make their own personal confession of Christ. This custom began about 300 years after the Bible was completed. Now, this is different from the baptism that was talked about in the Bible, which is only for those old enough to believe. The purpose is to publicly confess your personal commitment to Jesus Christ and to be obedient to God's plan for salvation to do what he asks you to do. Now, if you have your notes there at the very bottom of page nine, it's in a little uh, a larger font and it's bolded. It says, at community, it's a membership requirement that every member must have been baptized the way Jesus demonstrated by full immersion, even though many of us were confirmed as children. The majority of baptisms, baptisms that happen at community are not kids. I mean, we baptize a lot of kids, but we have you know, close to 300 people are baptized every year at community. And the majority of those by far are adults. And the majority of those adults that are being baptized were baptized by sprinkling as a baby. But understanding that that wasn't the practice in the early church, wanting to make the decision. So it's, 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 it's their decision. Let, let, me, let me talk to you for a moment because I know this might be some information that's coming at you and it's, and it's challenging um, because it, I've, I've had this conversation, not with hundreds, <laughs> but, but with thousands of people over the years. And, and I, I, can, I can be pretty sure that, that some that are watching this might feel that if, if I was to get baptized now after my faith journey, after my faith heritage of my family, I feel like 
Well, that it will invalidate what's gone on before. And I can't speak to that. Um, my mom and dad weren't believers um, when, when I was born and they came to faith later on. And, and so I, wasn't, I wasn't baptized as, as a baby, but if I had been, I, I would have been appreciative of my mom and dad wanting me to, to do something spiritual for me as I, as I entered into this world. But then after I discovered that in the New Testament, when someone came to faith, it wasn't a, an infant, I mean, it might have been an, an older youth or certainly an adult. It was their decision. It was their faith. It was their choice. And, and, and so I, I would not look at it as invalidating what had gone on uh, before. It's just completing. I mean, I, I, I'll go ahead and give you a kind of a quick analogy here as I, as I think about this because it's our spiritual walk. And, and uh, it was back in uh, November of this year that, uh, that we went to Phoenix to see the twins and the twins are Landon and Lily and they turned one year old and Lily was walking, but Landon wasn't. He's about two weeks after her, but it's fun to see little ones as these, you know, they're kind of uh, student walkers. I mean, they're just figured it out. They're trying to walk and they toddle and, and all that. But let's, let's say that if uh, for whatever reason that my son and daughter-in-law, Steve and Danny wanted uh, Landon and Lily to walk at six months, which I'm sure they didn't because they had two older kids and they know what walking means. The kids can get away from them, but let's say that they did. And they, they start holding their hands up and they start like strengthening their legs and I'm sure they did that um, but they're not walking at six months they're not walking at seven months they're track they're trying to get them they're strengthening them they're they're holding them but at 10 months they're trying at 11 months they're trying and then then they're holding on to the side of the couch and then they take a step and they fall and they take another step and and then then a little bit then they take three steps and then by the end of the week they're they're kind of toddling but they're walking and and that's a that's an analogy of, I think, our spiritual walk of our parents take spiritual steps for us before we can actually take them for ourselves. Maybe, maybe your parents did that for you and they had you christened or sprinkled or baptized as an infant. It wasn't your decision, but they're pointing you on a path toward Jesus. And then now you see in the Bible when someone made a faith decision that it was, it was their choice and they were the one that made the decision to be baptized. And the decision wasn't by sprinkling. Um, I mean, that, that came on much, much later. It was, it was by full immersion and that's how Jesus himself was baptized. And so you say that, okay, I, I want to... I want to follow Jesus as completely as I can. As a matter of fact, let's do this. Um, you're on page nine. Let's go back to page, the bottom of page six. Um, take you just a second to get there. These are the words of Jesus. This is the great commission. This is what Jesus said now. He said, go then to all people everywhere and make them my disciples. How? Baptize them. Now, what word did Jesus use there? Baptizo, a variation of that. So, this could be an accurate translation from the Greek of the great commission, the words of Jesus himself, go then to all people everywhere and make them my disciples, immerse them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to obey everything that I commanded you, immerse them. That's an accurate translation from the original Greek language. And that's what Jesus commands us to do. That's what Jesus gave us the example. That's the early church for 1300 years is the only um, approved or valid baptism that was accepted by the church. And so that's why, friend, we don't want to ask you to do anything more than what we think God is asking you to do. But we also don't want to ask you to do anything less. And so that's why in order to be a member at community, you can be a part of community, but in order to be a member at community, you have to be baptized by full immersion, just the way that Jesus was, just the way the church has practiced uh, throughout all of these uh, centuries. Now, it may be that you've already been baptized by full immersion, but you're hearing this now and you did not know a lot of this. You're saying, Scott, <laughs> if we were in a class, you would, your hands up and you'd say, you know, I, I already have been baptized by full immersion, but could I be baptized again? Most certainly. We never want anyone to be unsettled with their baptism. 
if, if for whatever reason, if there's a lot of life that's happened or you just didn't understand or for whatever reason, if you wanna be baptized again, we would be honored to do that. Now, let me say this, you don't have to be. If you were baptized by full immersion in another church, you don't need to be baptized again to be a part, to be a member at community because you're not baptized into the church. You're not baptized into community. You weren't baptized into that church. You were baptized into Jesus Christ. And so if, if uh, you're comfortable with your baptism by immersion and, and why you did that, then we are very comfortable with it too. And so, but having had this conversation with so many people over the years, sometimes people say, you know, I, I have been baptized by immersion, but I would like to do it again. We would be honored and we can set that up for you, you know, when a, a time is, is convenient for you in that way. So we turn the page, page 10. When should I be baptized? As soon as you've believed. Um, those who believed, they were baptized that day. And that's, and this is Acts chapter two. That was the day of Pentecost. That was the very first day when uh, the apostle Peter preached the message of hope. And 3,000 people said, I want to do this. I want in. I want to be baptized. Which uh, is a good segue for me to say that they made that decision the very first time they heard this. And it may be that you're hearing this and you're going, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning, but I'm not sure if I'm ready. And, uh, and I get that. Maybe you're not, but maybe you are. I mean, that day, 3,000 people, the very first time they heard any of this, they decided that they wanted to respond in faith to what Jesus had called them to do. And, and so they, they responded in that way. Um, there's no reason to delay. As soon as you believe in Jesus and you repent, you can and should be baptized. If you wait until you are perfect, you will never be good enough. A lot of times people think that they got to get their life cleaned up you know, before they come to Jesus. And I, frankly, I appreciate that spirit. It's a repentant heart. It's a desire to change. But, but here's the thing. You'll never be fully perfect. You'll never get everything changed. And Jesus says, come on, come as you are. That's how I want you to come. Come on. And, and um, I, I kind of like this story. Rick Warren, who wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. And he, he told one time about how he bought this, uh, this great gift for his wife, Kay, that he thought it was gonna be the Grand Slam, Grand Slam gift of all gifts. And he thought that she was gonna just thank him every single week for what a great husband, what a great guy he was. He bought her the gift of a house cleaning service for a year. And let's say it was, I don't know, I can't remember. I heard this story 30 years ago. And uh, let's say that they would come in and they would clean their house on Thursday. And, and Rick Warren said, I came to hate this gift because every Thursday this person would come and clean our house. So what did we do on Wednesday night before they came? We cleaned our house. Why? Because we didn't want this person to think that we were slobs. I mean, we lived in our house. And so we would do all this cleaning work and we'd save like the last 5% for them to clean so they'd have something to do. And, and that's what God is saying. Look, let me do the heavy duty cleaning in your life. Don't save the last 5% for me thinking that you've got to clean your life up all on your own. God says, let's do this together. That's why I love to say that Christianity is a decision that's followed by the process of transformation. So you make this decision and then you and God together said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my Holy Spirit industrial strength cleaner into your life. And we're going to, transformation is going to be a lifelong journey together. So again, um, if you wait until you're perfect, You'll never, ever be good enough. So we make that decision, but we have a repentant heart. Can my family be baptized together? Yes, if each family member understands fully the meaning of baptism and each one has personally placed their trust in Jesus for salvation, we encourage families to be baptized at the same time. It's a wonderful expression of commitment. Children and teenagers who wish to be baptized are asked to attend one of our age-appropriate baptism classes. And so we have these classes for kids and for middle school students and high school students, and we want them to understand on, 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 on their level, on their terms, because we want them to make that faith decision. Now, it says in that box there on page 10, however, it's important to remember that baptism is a personal statement of faith, not a family tradition. It's not wise to delay your baptism while waiting on other family members to accept Jesus, particularly children. It puts undue pressure on them and it delays your response. It delays your obedience. So we don't want to put that pressure on kids. What should I wear when I'm baptized? That's a great question. It depends upon where you're going to be baptized. It says, we put in our notes here, women and men should wear dark colored shorts. Good idea. Just trust me on that. Dark is better than white. Um, 
Those being baptized will receive a special baptism t-shirt to wear and keep. If you see any of these black, believe, belong, become t-shirts around, those are my favorite shirts. We have all kinds of shirts here at Community. Those are my favorites because the only way you can get one of those is by being baptized. You can get the other ones, you can buy them, but you can't buy a black, believe, belong, become. That's a baptism shirt that way. It says bring an extra change of undergarments, bring a plastic bag for your wet clothes and whatever other toiletries you desire. We have changing rooms, we have got towels, we've got hair dryers, we've got all that. The, the biggest question, um, you know, at, uh, at this time of the year in January is, uh, is the water heated? And said, so, yes, it is heated. That's why we call our baptistry inside the auditorium. We call it our holy hot tub. It is our jacuzzi for Jesus. The one that's out in the courtyard, it's also heated. It's our jacuzzi for Jesus. So they're both heated, so you don't have to worry about that. And so you could be baptized either location, in the auditorium or in, in the courtyard that way. Uh, we'll have to say anything. Uh, you just are gonna be asked, the, the person that's baptizing you, or they're gonna ask you to repeat the confession of your faith, the, the words that, that Simon Peter asked us to say that, I mean, we see that this played out uh, one time that he was walking along a road in the, the general vicinity of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And Simon Peter said, I, well, I believe that you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. So believers for the centuries have been saying, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God, my Lord and savior. And we ask you to make that faith declaration as well. It says, we give you a DVD of your baptism. You'll be given a baptismal certificate. We encourage you to invite your, your relatives and friends to attend your baptism. And here's the thing, you can be baptized um, during a worship service. I mean, it's such a great encouragement. You're not gonna say anything. You're gonna be on a screen. It's in the middle of a song and the church is gonna celebrate your faith decision that way. You can be baptized that way. If you'd rather not be baptized during a worship service, during our, our song time, you can be baptized after a service is over in a completely private setting. Why? Because baptisms happen that way in the New Testament. They happen in a public setting and in a more private setting. Both are honoring to God. You could be baptized uh, in our courtyard area and people might be around or they may not be around. It just depends upon the time when that happens. So a public setting or a private setting baptism are both God honoring. And so we encourage you to, uh, to consider uh, you know, that as well. I, we're, gonna, we're gonna show you a baptism video. Um, this never gets old for me. When I, when I see a person, and when you watch this video, you're gonna see someone. Uh, they're, they're going to uh, reenact Jesus' crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But more than that, you're gonna see them uh, share with Jesus in his death, be united with Jesus in his, in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But more than that, they're gonna have their own spiritual crucifixion, their own spiritual burial, their own spiritual resurrection and it absolutely absolutely never gets old because we're we're never the same after we make this decision watch watch this video Deeper seas. 
It never gets old for me to see these baptism vi videos. Uh, we're never the same again. And I'm so thankful that you've um, watched this first part of our Discovering Community class. So there's gonna be a part two that you can click on in a moment. But if you have questions about baptism, you can click on one of the links. There's an FAQ about how we're gonna do this on decision day. You can certainly be baptized before decision day, but there's additional information that's on this page. But thank you, thank you for joining us for part one of our Discovering Community class.